Hello, our friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Hello there. Welcome back. So we did this quick little video over on Patreon, but very, very powerful. And uh, it makes, I think, a great point. And, you know, the system that we are in is being exposed big time. You can't stop this. It's, it's too big, and I, they're not going to be able to damage control this. Well, you know, I think it's um, trying to get all the horses back in the barn, so I don't think it's going to happen. No, it's too late. It, it is definitely too late. Um, what I want to tell you is about an event that you may not know. As you see these headlines, Colorado, women and babies, that S word. Uh, yeah, government ownership, Rockefeller's Colorado mines. What's, what's going on here? The Colorado situation. This was 1914. Fascinating that 1914 is the first year of the First World War. And, of course, this person, as you see this face, this is, you know, John Rockefeller uh, himself. It, you know, when you think about it, again, the war, First World War ended in 1918 when we had that outbreak of Spanish flu. Uh, you could see the headlines here. Volleys fired in the streets. Proposes government ownership of Rockefeller's Colorado Mines. What is going on? All these women and children, and many lost their lives. This is really a tragic event that most people don't even, maybe never even heard of. Honestly, this is the first time I actually heard of this. And, you know, I do a lot of research. And what you're looking at is, is the aftermath of what was a very, very tragic, tragic event. April 1914. The National Guard, the United States National Guard, slaughtered men, women, and children in Colorado. And J.D. Rockefeller had media cover it up. On April 19th and 20th, 1914, during a minor strike in Colorado, the National Guard killed dozens of people. Though the exact number of casualties is disputed, most sources agree at least four women and 11 children were amongst the dead. When the workers first went on strike, they were evicted from the company-owned housing, company-owned housing, in the mining town. So they set up massive tent colonies outside of the towns. The workers were protesting for higher wages and better working qualities, but were making very little progress. The largest in of these tent cities was in Ludlow, just outside the John D. Rockefeller's Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. The tent city in Ludlow housed over 1,200 people. Entire families, including children, were living in the tents. The strike had been ongoing for four months before the massacre, with tensions rising between the military and strikers with every passing day. Then one day the tensions came to a head and National Guard set up a machine gun on a hill overlooking the tent city for a strike and began raining bullets down on the workers and their families. The soldiers then invaded the colony, began setting fire to the tents, trapping many innocent people to die inside. When news of the violence spread, miners all over the state began to revolt and went to war with the coal companies, shooting and attacking soldiers and mine owners, as well as dismantling railroad tracks and blowing mines shut. Eventually, the army was called in to quell the uprising, and protesters went back home or back to work. However, news of the incident was beginning to spread, tarnishing the Rockefeller's reputation, inspiring more protest. To deal with this problem of public perception, Rockefeller, Rockefeller hired public relations pioneer Ivy Lee. Lee was an early influence of Edward Bernays, who would later write the infamous book Propaganda, a textbook of mind control for tyrants and aristocrats. Bernays is often called the father of propaganda. If this is so, then Ivy Lee is the grandfather. It's likely that Rockefeller picked Lee for the job because years earlier he came up with the idea that would rev revolutionize how corporations and governments communicated with the peasants. In 1906, when a horrible train accident happened in Atlantic City, Lee suggests the company issue a statement presenting their side of the story to the press. This was to be the first press release. The disaster was caused by negligence on the part of the railroad company and was witnessed by hundreds of people. So the press release was a special measure taken in hopes to get their side of the story out first. 
The press release scheme was a success, and two days later, New York Times just printed the company's statement word for word. This kind of insanity continues to this day, where the news reporters simply regurgitate the statement from the White House or from Exxon about what they're doing, instead of making any attempt to investigate, uh, do actual investigative journalism. Starting with the Ludlow Massacre, Lee began to ch change the public image of the Rockefeller family and their businesses, even if it meant telling blatant lies. Lee sent out mass bulletins claiming that the people who had been killed in, in the Colorado protests were the victims of a house fire caused by an overturned stove, when in reality those fires were intentionally set by National Guard soldiers. He also accused a popular union worker named Mother Jones of being a prostitute and running a brothel because she was a vocal activist who was bringing the national spotlight on the incident. On Lee's advice, Rockefeller wrote the statement one month after the incident insisting that there was no Ludlow massacre. The engagement started as a desperate fight for life by two small squads of militia against the entire tent colony. There were no women or children shot by the authorities of the state or representatives of the operators. While the loss of life is profound and to be regretted, it is unjust in the extreme to lay it at the door of the defenders of law and property who were no slightest way responsible for it. For a short time, Lee and the Rockefellers were able to manage public perception of the event on a national level, though many residents of Colorado were already well aware of the truth behind the massacre. Eventually, the word spread and caused outrage across the country, sparking widespread protests that eventually led to congressional hearings. As expected, the congressional hearings solved nothing and brought no justice for the families of the slain children and minors. To repair the public image of Rockefeller name, Lee suggested the family make high-profile donations to various charities and have photographs taken of them handing out money to commoners to make people think they were good-hearted and generous. Again, the plan worked, and application of public relations was able to resurrect Rockefeller's reputation and then build it to the point where it is today. Now, it's interesting, too, because um, I'll give you all the links um, Poison Ivy Lee and his propaganda, you know, who else he was associated with was Hitler and the Nazis. Kid you not, they were actually using him uh, as well as a propaganda tool. This is interesting because many will, will make note that a Rothschild bank was seized by, by Hitler, but that was just a stunt, in my opinion. That was just a stunt. That was another public relations thing to make them look good because in reality okay they they seize the bank and then wink wink nod nod nothing really changes this is all part of the bigger picture you know again uh average people lost their lives but average people mean nothing uh to the control system this is the bottom line there's there's multiple tellings of this from you know all really given the same story and please do go ahead and uh, search it for yourself the national guard being used as a tool of the rockefellers and the other illuminati families the ability to deal with people is as a purchasable a commodity as sugar or coffee and I will pay more for that ability than for any other under the sun. That's a quote of Rockefeller. Yeah, absolutely. Does that surprise me? Of course not. This, these people are as pure evil as evil gets. They're all about control and power. They view themselves as, as above everybody. This is really uh, very, very telling with you know the reality of what we have here. Andrew Carnegie established Carnegie Institute for College and University Research. Obviously, John D. Rockefeller created General Education Board to promote education in the South. No, that's Indoctrination Board. And then J.P. Morgan financed the buyout of Louisville and Nashville Railroad by Atlantic Coastline Railroad and, and much more again. This is your, your banking cabal or par, a portion of your banking cabal. It's also the education portion uh, or we should say indoctrination uh, portion of really allopathic medicine when you get down to it. And on statement, a statement on record, I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. Yeah, absolutely. 
the General Education or the General Indoctrination Board going back to 1903. This really tells everything. And again, people like Ivy Lee, who, you know, gives you a method to sell the madness to convince the populace that, you know, you're actually a good guy when you're a bad guy. It is a pretty scary situation. And it's ongoing, and the only thing we can do is educate ourselves, um, share the videos, help other people understand, and hope that they wake up out of their slumber. Um, these these are the things that I think we need to do as individuals, knowing that there's still so many asleep to this stuff, so many don't understand that the only education anyone's going to get is the education that the Rockefellers want you to have. So that's that. And this little guy is uh, concerned about it, too. Yeah, it, it, it is scarier than Halloween. Absolutely. You know, again, trusting the science. We can never trust the science because it's sales. You know, our science is sales. This is the reality. It's all a business model. As always, guys, thanks for your support over on Patreon. We couldn't do it without you guys. Source bless and namaste. Namaste.